you knew deep down inside of you there was something that you could say, something you could bring up, a situation, a question that was just a hot button that could completely sabotage the whole conversation, that could complete, show of hands, anybody, any, real high, pastor, these are your troublemakers right here, so, <laughs> I know things, I know a conversation, a way to wake, make my wife smile, is to talk about Paris, or the opera, Disney, Anything sparkly or gold. <laughs> I know how to make my brother absolutely furious in a matter of like six seconds. There's a song I found on the internet that I just interject every once in a while and I see it just a cloud over him all the rest of the day. It's, uh, I would never do that, but I'm saying I know. Um, <laughs> but I know if you start talking about cruise lines with him or the Andy Griffith show, like he's, you're instantly friends. Um, <clears throat> I know if you talk to my dad and you mention creating something or inventing something, like he's on board. There's, there's a connection there. I'm pretty sure he's about one bad haircut and a lab coat away from becoming Doc from Back to the Future. He's that guy. Um, <clears throat> my mom, you talk about her kids or her grandkids, and she'll just, you guys are best buds. She'll talk all day long. Um, I work with a guy named Tony. He's really late for church right there. He... Uh, <laughs> If you show him a basketball mixtape, you, you guys are super tight immediately. Um, <clears throat> now, what does that matter? When you search the scriptures um, through the life of Jesus, uh, a, a question popped out to me. How many people really knew Jesus? How many people knew the intimacies and what made Jesus who he was? And who he was was so much more than a man, a healer, a savior. <clears throat> now, there were benefits to being in a crowd surrounding Jesus. He had crowds everywhere he went. Um, the, I mean, you get free food all the time, uh, just lots of it. Um, although he would, he would attract sometimes some pretty less than reputable people, so there's a good chance you might catch, you might catch leprosy or something. But he could heal you. It's fine. Um, <clears throat> however, the Bible doesn't really specify anything about the crowd other than to address the crowd in general. Um, as long as you remain in the crowd, there's so big of a chance that you will absolutely remain where you are without your miracle, without your touch. Zacchaeus climbed a tree to see him. The sick woman touched him and was healed. The blind man cried out and Jesus recognized him. The demonic possessed man ran to the beach and worshiped him. <laughs> James 4 8 says draw near to God and he will draw near unto you Revelations 3 20 says this is from God's perspective behold I stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door I will come to him and will sup with him and he with me I want you to know that God is interested in you from the beginning of creation the the whole idea was a relationship with you communication with you so my question to you is this morning, are we here to punch a clock so that way our guilt doesn't override us? Are we here because our aunt said that we had to come or, or our friend and family just to appease them and to get them off our back? When's the last time we spent time just in the comfort of his presence, feeling that peace that passes all understanding, simply knowing that he's here? Proximity changes things. <clears throat> How many times have we been loitering around an altar at home or at church, just enjoying the presence and the grace of God. How many times have we trembled in his presence, in the awesome presence of God? The reason I know about these hot buttons and passions with my friends and family, Derek, my mom, my dad, Tony, my wife, is because I've worked side by side with them hours every day. I've spent hours under the roof. I've shared meals. We've shared conversations. And through that, there's a depth. There's a, a gravity of our relationship that you can't get from just hello, my name is on the street. So I want to know, do you know Jesus? Are you interested in knowing Jesus? Because when I know Jesus, that's when my neighbor gets healed. And when I know Jesus, that's when my neighborhood gets saved. And when I know Jesus, it doesn't matter what the future holds because I know that he's holding on to my future. My eternal, my eternal salvation is not locked in in this place. So there are a lot of people here today. We would officially, I think, qualify as a crowd, but I don't want to be part of the crowd. I want to be the one.
Praise the Lord. I know things too. <laughs> but what I really love is when I'm reading scripture and God shows me something I'd never seen before. Uh, in this case, it was a comma. Um, if we could just stand, we're going to read Second uh, Chronicles 7.14. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You could, you could be seated. Um, not too long ago, I was reading that and I looked at the last part and it said, we'll heal their land. And then I looked at the news and I looked at what was going on in the world, in our country, in our land. And, and I just, it really struck me because I know the word of God is true. So I prayed and, and I said, God, are, are we missing something? Am I missing something? And he said, read it again. So I read the scripture, if my people which are called by my name. Now, I looked it up, and the literal, literal word for word translation of that is, if my people on whom my name is called. Now, if that doesn't sound like the people of the name of Jesus and those who are baptized in Jesus' name, I don't know what it means. This scripture is in the Old Testament, but I believe it's prophetic. I believe it's talking to us and it's talking about us. So I went on, shall humble themselves and pray. And I thought, Lord, people are praying. People are praying more than they ever did before. I'm praying more. I know most of us are praying more than they ever did before. And seek my face. And, and people are turning from their wicked ways. We, we've just started at the beginning of service to have a time of repentance before we go into the service. Um, he says, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So, but I don't see that. He said, read it again. So I read, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, stop. And there I saw it. Right after shall humble themselves was a comma. I never noticed it before. If I did, I never paid attention to it. I'd always read it. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, as if the scripture was saying, shall humble themselves to pray. But there's a comma there. They're two completely separate things. The first thing that God wants is for us to humble ourselves and then pray and seek my face. Um, if you look in the Old Testament, in the time of the kings, um, in Chronicles and Kings, over and over again, I was amazed how many times that the Bible said this about this king or about that king. It said that he humbled himself before God or he humbled not himself before God. And in many cases, whether or not the nation was destroyed or not depended on whether the king and the people humbled themselves. In Proverbs uh, 6, 16 and 17, it says, These six things does, doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him. Number one on the list of things God hates is a proud look being filled with pride and looking down on others. Uh, that's why in Philippians, it tells us to esteem others better than ourselves. A uh, couple more scriptures. First Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. James 4, 10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So, is it any wonder that if we want him to hear from heaven and to forgive our sins and to heal our land, that the very first thing that God wants us and requires of us is that we humble ourselves. So if nothing else, the next time you read that scripture, I want you to see that comma. If my people which are called by my name 
shall humble themselves. That comes first. Amen. That fits right in with this next uh, song. God is so great. When you truly understand just how big he is, it's a little bit easier to become humble.
standing with me just for a moment. It's already been a wonderful day. I got to meet Pete this morning. We had breakfast with him and Eric and Lisa. Great to chat with you guys. Joy was in there. Felipe and Claudia in there. My goodness, talk about a crowd. It was a small room. It was a great time, great time of fellowship. Thank you, uh, Montebell and Juan. Thank you guys for taking care of that room for us and making the room welcoming to all of our guests. I appreciate your service to God. Amen. <coughs> Let's look at a familiar portion of scripture to most of us, John chapter 3 and verse 3. Welcome to all of our guests. If you ever have questions about what we do here, just ask Tim. <laughs> well, I appreciated those take fives this morning. Thank you for the time you invested in, and uh, definitely touched a touched a button. God wanted us to be alerted to John three three. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, <clears throat> How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We hear that spoken quite often in the church world, and 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 they hone in on born again, and they they attribute born again as some kind of a spiritual experience only between them and God and. And, and they just born again, and yet we look, <coughs> we look at it, and Jesus followed up in verse seven, and said, "Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again." All of a sudden, born again becomes more than a experience. It becomes more than more than something that either I am or I am not an experience I've had something I associate with and all of a sudden Jesus said you must and when Jesus says you must it's no longer a suggestion it's uh it turns into something way stronger than that and so 
I want to preach, we talk about you must be born again. And when we look at that, Jesus is basically saying, now these are his words. He is saying the way we were born is not sufficient. You must be born again. So he was saying, I won't accept what you are now. You have to change. And, you know, from what I used to be, I needed to change. In fact, my wife will tell you I need to do some more changing, and I'm working on that. <clears throat> but Jesus said that we need to change. And I want to talk about not just making a change, but I want to talk about keeping the change. So I want to preach on keep the change. Would you mind just praying with me for a moment? Lord, we thank you for your power, the power in your word. We thank you for the power in your blood. We thank you for the power of your spirit. We thank you for the joy of your presence. God, would you help us today to receive your precious word in a manner in which you want it spoken and received today. We ask that you bless us, lead us, continue to mold and shape us into something that is acceptable to you, not to my wife, not to the church, not to my neighbor, but to you. And I praise you for that, Lord. Thank you for that. Could we just put our hands together again and thank you for the word. May the Lord bless you. You may be seated. There are people that get in trouble, and you've heard it, seen it on a video, read it in a book, where somebody committed a crime. And there was an eyewitness and saw them commit this crime and a lot of times if the crime is is of any intensity and the consequences may be high that witness will be put in witness protection system because because their life is in danger why because if you can get rid of the witness then the crime won't be fulfilled and charged and put on somebody's record because it's just one person's word against another. But we have, we have Jesus who lived a life of purity and his actions, his words, his life spoke of ability and righteousness and holiness. And Jesus, because of the convicting that he did to the religious world in which he lived, because of the way he lived and the things that he said and the things that he did, it brought conviction in the lives of people that claimed to be religious. So what did they do? They got rid of the witness. They got rid of the testimony against them by putting him on a cross. And if Jesus is dead, then we don't have to worry how we live. We don't have to worry what we say. We don't have to govern what we do because there is no witness of absolute righteousness. But then again, there's also no hope. If Jesus died and stayed in the grave, then there's no hope for you and there's no hope for me. But if Jesus came out of the grave, we can be excited because if he is the firstborn from the grave, then you and I can also rise from a grave should we live longer and not see the rapture. But if he did really come out of the grave, then there was, there's also some things that Jesus said. You know, you, you know as well as I do that <clears throat> when I was going to high school, middle school, junior high, etc., some college, I put off did you ever hear the word cram? Now, logic, logic says you have two months, you have three months. 
spread it out. You know, our, our quizzers, they don't wait till the week before and say, now these are the scriptures that you'll be quoting, all 400 of them. You'll be quoting them next week. They start out with 10 and then 15 and they add another five and they add another five so that they don't have to cram at the end. But you and I, the m more mature we get, the more we put off. <coughs> we, we push things off and wait until it's going to take us a weekend, a week of cramming and preparing and getting ready for that. Because if you remove a test, you and I will wait forever. We won't feel the necessity to... That's why, why do you think people preach on the soon coming of Jesus Christ? We're trying to say that there is a test coming. The test is a pass or fail. There is no multiple choice. There is no grading of A, B, C, D, or U. There is a grade of P or F. Either you pass or you fail. When the rapture comes, you make it or you don't. It's that simple. But when we feel like we have forever, we have a tendency not to worry about it. Now, if I said by noon, by noon, Jesus will be here. He told me this morning, there would be some cramming going on. There would be like, Pastor, could you hold off that thought? i got to get to the altar now because I got some cramming. There's a list. I got a list that I got to get through, and I don't know if an hour is enough. Do you know what I'm saying? But we wait. We put off. We delay. If there's no test, we don't prepare. But if Jesus is alive, there is hope. If Jesus really came out of the grave then there is hope for you and there is hope for me. But there is a test. And it has to do with some things he said. I am not here to eliminate the word grace from the New Testament. That's not what I'm here for. But I am here to say that grace was a word that is used many times in the New Testament, but so is sin. So is condemnation in a sense of condemning the sin, not the person. There are words that Jesus said in Revelation when he said, nothing that defileth will be found in heaven. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, nobody gave me any notes, uh, nobody called me before church and said, by the way, Mark is going to be there. Uh, you don't know who he is, but I know a lot of stuff about him, so I'm going to give you a list that I want you to preach on. Nobody did that. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to bring to our attention a few scriptures. Paul said, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve. The twelve saw him. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. 500 people at one time saw Jesus walking, alive, breathing after the grave. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present. At the time of the writing of Paul to the church of Corinth... Paul said many of those people are still alive that saw him alive. And it says, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Paul said, I saw him. Now, it's exciting to read somebody's letter. We're opening somebody's letter, and the person who wrote this letter said, I saw him alive after the grave. He is alive. And to, to read that is exciting. I don't know about you, but the thing that we love to talk about is life after death. We love to talk about the power of the resurrection, and that's exciting, but the problem that that brings is it also resurrects the things that he said. 
if Jesus said something, if Jesus said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. We like to preach about that. We like the fact that death no longer has a hold and he will break the chains of death and he will take the sting out of death. That's exciting. But when Jesus said, if you're not born again, you're not going to see heaven. We're like, no, no, don't, don't. Let's talk about the resurrection. Let's talk about forgiveness. Let's talk. And that yet everything he said has got to be applicable to today or nothing is true. Either we accept all of it or we accept none of it. If I have the right to tear some pages out of here, then you have, there's some pages you don't like, I'm sure. So I'll pass the Bible around, and you get to, yes, we'll start with you, Pastor Goff, and you get to tear out the pages. By the time we get done, I'll have a little black cover. And, 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 and the last pages that are torn up will be because the person just wants to get involved. They say, you tore out my page, and so I'm just going to tear out another one. But if we do that, if you and I have the right, and every other denomination in this world has a right, and the atheists have a right, and the politicians have a right to say, this is not important, and start to tear it apart, where do we stop? So we either have to make a decision. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Or we just live our lives in a manner which appease us. I just want to go to my grave with people saying, he was a nice guy. Is that my ultimate objective? Well, that'd be nice, but I'm not called to be nice. I'm called to be true. I'm called to be directed. But he is alive, and that brings a problem, and he said some things, and some of the things he said has to do with keeping the change. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, I've read, I've read scriptures before, and you read over it, and you don't understand the word. You think you know what it means, but you just keep reading because there's a lot to get through. You know what I'm saying? And you read through it, and, and it says, but the fearful, but the fearful. He's talking about not making it to heaven. But the fearful, fearful and unbelieving. Well, I believe, and I'm not afraid. And the abominable, well, that's a snowman. The abominable snowman. And murderers and whoremongers. Well, I've never killed anybody, and I'm not a whoremonger. And sorcerers, I don't wear a pointed hat and sit around in a crystal ball, and idolaters, well, I'm not, I don't worship idols, and all liars, well, I don't worship false gods, I, and all liars, well, I'm not a sorcerer, and all liars, why did God, why did he throw that in? He threw that in with sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, I'm going to, that's the page I want to tear out, uh, where is that page, um, shall have their part in, they shall have their part in sitting in the corner for 10 days. It says they shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. I need to change. I, I need, if, if, if any of this is true, then, then all of it's true. But what does the fearful mean? I looked it up. The main meaning of fearful is cowards. It's a coward. What's a coward? Coward is not someone that loses a fight. A coward is someone who won't even fight. They won't even get in the fight to protect what's his. You see, a coward is someone that says, well, I believe in Jesus unless somebody puts a gun to my head. I believe in Jesus unless I don't agree with something he said. I believe in Jesus unless there's a really cute girl that won't date me if I say I'm a, I love Jesus. It's always this if stuff. See, a coward says, I only believe in Jesus in 270 East Schick Road. On Wednesday and on Sunday. At all other times, it's subject to to change. There's only one change that God intended for our lives, and that's to be more like him. And once we become that way, he wants us to keep it. Woo! 
Pastor Adi, I feel like preaching. But it's somebody who won't even fight to protect what's yours. I mean, honey, I love you. And some guy jumps out of a dark alley and starts to pull her by the hair. And I say, well, good luck. I'll be, I'll be praying for you, sweetie. <laughs> oh, God, would you protect my wife? You all know what she'd say. She'd say, thank you. Thank you, baby cheeks. Thanks for praying for me. <laughs> she'd say, you're a coward. Get over here and protect what's yours. I'm yours. God gave me to you. God gave us this truth. And if we're not willing to protect it, if we're not willing to give our lives for it, then we are a coward. Oh, God. <laughs> the unbelieving there means refuse to believe. Oh, I've met some people like that. I believe in God. Well, then the Bible says this. I don't see it that way. What do you look? How do you? What translation are you reading? The Bob Betcher version? Or are you reading the Bible version? The version that says you must be born. Well, I just believe in grace. He said you got to be born again. Well, I just believe that God loves everybody. Yes, but he loves you enough to tell you how to get out of this world alive. We can get out of this world alive. But refuse to believe. Uh, and, and murderers and whoremongers. What's a whoremonger? Well, a whoremonger is... Somebody who stands on the corner and solicits for money. No, they're included. But a whoremonger is basically sexual sin. That's it. it, it sexual sin drives your life. Sorcerers, we know what that is, evil magic. Well, it's, it's, white, it, it's, it's white magic. <laughs> Let me look that up. How do you spell that? White magic. There's no such thing as white magic. It's either God's power and his miraculous supernatural, or it's not. It's driven by self and, and selfishness. Sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their place. And I'm not excited about that. If, if lying is something, I mean, it was something... If, talk, politicians, if their mouth is moving, they're lying. You know that. And, and it's, uh, this world, is, it's like, well, that's okay because he doesn't want to hurt somebody's feelings. It doesn't say that here. Now, if you don't like somebody's suit or dress or whatever, you don't just walk up and say, well, I don't want to be a liar. That's really ugly. You know, there are some things you just don't have to say. But if you willfully say something that's not true, then God says, that's a lie. And God is saying, I, my church is better than that. I am going to rapture a church that is without spot or blemish, no wrinkle. If you have a problem with lying, it's time to get power over. Well, I had to save my job. I had to protect my wife. I had to, lying is lying. We get so numb from this world. I don't know about you, but we can get numb from slowly getting involved in it. And next thing you know, we're, how did I get here? I, I start to accept one little piece of it, and, and then it's a bigger piece, and then it's a bigger piece, and pretty soon it's so overwhelming that it takes over my life. In Mark chapter 7, 21, for from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covet covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness. If you read lascivious real quick, you don't have to look it up. You can sound real smart, though. You know, I never get involved in lasciviousness and uh, fornication. and You, you don't even know what it means. But when you look it up, it's adulteries. That's typically married. Fornication is sexual sin, unmarried usually. 
murders. We know what that is. Thefts. What is covetousness? The ERV listed as just greed. I want more than I have, and I'm not going to be happy until I get it. Wickedness, deceit, we know what that is. Lasciviousness, it is defined as unrestrained sexual instinct. Unrestrained sexual instinct. An evil eye, that's basically staring somebody down with evil intent. Blasphemy, look out. I thought blasphemy was only just total rejection and open degradation of God. It's not. It's hurtful speech. That's one of the hurtful speech. If you continually say things that are hurtful to others, this is getting tough. Now we only have 45 minutes. Should I stop now <laughs> before, before noon? But saying things that are hurtful to others, in, 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 you know, obviously you, ma- you make a mistake and you, you're like, oh, I didn't mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did I offend you? I didn't, I didn't really mean to do that. And I'm not saying that that humorously, I'm saying sometimes we say things, it's like, oh, I'm so dumb. Why did I say that? I said that, and, and it hurts somebody, and I'm so sorry. Um, and, and I don't mean to do that, but pride and foolishness. It says all these evil things come from within and defile the man. All these things defile us. Well, I don't want to be defiled. Why? Because Revelation 21 says there shall in no wise enter into it, heaven, anything that defileth. Well, if I have something of that in me, then I am defiled, and I have to figure out how to get it out. It says, Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Last part, it says this, Galatians 5, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, there's that word again, idolatry, witchcraft. This is all New Testament. This is, this is under the umbrella of grace. Witchcraft, hatred, variance. Okay, I know what hatred is, but what's variance? I looked it up this morning. It means to be contentious. Don't look at your neighbor. You listen to him? Contentious. Emulations. Well, good thing I don't, I'm not, I don't have emulations in my life because I have no idea what it means. Emulations, it means like jealousy with indignation. I am so, when, you, when you are blessed, I, I am to the point of indignation that it, it just bothers me. When you are blessed and I don't get, where's mine? And it's, it's to the point of indignation, wrath, strife. I know what that is. Seditions, not sure what that is. So I looked it up. One guy said, when he was reading through Galatians 5.19 with Pastor Yance, and I've mentioned this before, he read through it and he said, and, and it started out and he said, Sin. He said, you know, sin is going to disqualify us for heaven unless we deal with it. And he said, what exactly is sin? And when Pastor Yance read through this, he said, might be better if a guy didn't know some of that stuff. (laughs) Doesn't that sound like him? You know, there's another scripture I'm going to read shortly, but it's important that we study and we understand and we figure this out because God said it and it's important. Sedition means disunion and dissension and causing division. God, help me. Heresies. Heresies, what is that? Some radical religion. Really what a heresy is? They called this a heresy. Truth. Jesus was a heretic. What does it mean? It means a choice involving disunion. When you make a choice for something that causes disunion on purpose... Um, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. Revelings, I didn't know what that is. Rioting. What is rioting? It's getting people together to oppose authority. Help me, Jesus. And such the like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you, he said, this is just a reminder, by the way, in times past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Is this important? Yes. Yes. Where does grace come in? That's what you're experiencing right now. I'm experiencing grace right now. What does that mean? Because of my life, I don't fall over dead. I don't go up in a puff of smoke. God has given me until noon to say, Jesus, I'm going to respond to some of these things. I'm going to approach you, God, and I'm going to ask you. What, what, 1 Corinthians, New Testament, 6, 9, and then I'm done with this part. 
Everyone said, praise the Lord. <laughs> know ye not that the unrighteous, good, I'm glad, I'm glad it's, he's not talking about me, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It seems, where is grace in all of this? Well, I believe in God, I believe God is love, and I believe in grace. Yes, but don't tear out the rest of the New Testament and the Old Testament that is still valid. He said, be not deceived. The reason he said that is because we can. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Every, every thing I looked up, and that means homosexual. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. It gets a little more graphic. Nor thieves. You can't steal things. Nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers. That's to abuse, with, abuse others with insults. Nor extortioners. That means to cheat. If I cheat somebody... I'm an extortioner. Folks, we need to change. Heaven is such a glorious place and a place filled with righteousness and holiness that we can make it. But Jesus said we need to change. There are some things that this world counts as acceptable. Jesus never governed his church by the world. He is governing the world by the church. He's saying, I will use the church to be a witness because he used himself and said, I want to show you. He said, I know it's pretty rough, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. He said, I did it and now I'm going to come into your heart and I'm going to help you do it. You can make it. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You've heard this story before, and I'll make it brief, but I looked it up, and some say it's valid, some say it's not. I don't know. I wasn't there. But they say that they can, they can uh, uh, catch a wolf, and they do it by taking a very sharp knife, and they dip it in blood, something that the wolf is used to, and they uh, dip it in blood many times, and they freeze it. They dip it in, and they make like a popsicle out of this very, very, very sharp knife. And then they turn around and they put it upside down in the snow and they pour water around it so that it freezes in place. And they just leave it there. And the wolves pick up the scent of the knife and the blood and they come from a long ways off and they are very wary of it and they circle it and they circle it. And pretty soon someone, one of them gets brave and they approach it and they smell it and they say, man, that's that smells like blood, and you know we like blood. And so it begins to consume the blood on the knife, and soon it, it, it gets so involved in the blood of that knife that it's enjoying itself that its tongue gets cut by the sharp knife. And pretty soon they're thinking, man, there's, there's way more blood on this knife than I thought there was. And what they don't know is that their tongue, be, it became cut on the sharp knife because of the ice cold blood that they were licking, their tongue became numb, and then it became cut, and now they were bleeding, and they were literally consuming their own blood until the fact that they got so weak that they passed out, and that's where the Eskimo found them next to the blade. Sin is like that. We approach it, we look at it, and we circle it. Pretty soon we get brave enough to get close enough, and then we think this could be somewhat enjoyable and then the frozen part of it because Jesus is fire but the others is not and it numbs us to the feeling and next thing you know we lick the knife and next thing you know we're consuming our own blood so to speak and it gets a hold of us never intending to give our life for a cup full of blood but thankful Jesus poured out his own blood on a cross to say, I know that you did this, but I have provided a different kind of blood, not frozen, but dripping from Calvary's cross to cover your sins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, it says this. After reading verse 9, and we read about what does not qualify for heaven or what disqualifies us, we also read, we go on and read in verse 11, it says, and such were some of you, but you are washed. You are just sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit 
of our God. I'm so thankful that that scripture is there because scriptures are there to give us direction and to illuminate our failures and our imperfections. But Jesus didn't stop there. He said, I want you to know that nobody deserves heaven and nobody will get there on your own. And this is who you are. And it exposes us and we have a decision to make. Will I address my problem or problems or will I leave it go and hope and just hope that he won't apply his word to my life. I'm not sure about you. I am not going to condemn anybody, but I do know this. This word will stand forever. And I want to do everything that I can to follow this word. But it says we are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this. Why did Paul write that in chapter 6? He said we are justified in the name. So it has something to do with the name of Jesus and by the spirit of our God. In my opening scripture, it said you must be born again of water and spirit. He said it born again has something to do with water and it has something to do with spirit. And Paul after the fact, Jesus said, you have to be born again. After the fact, Paul said, you are justified what? In the name and by the spirit. Paul was merely reiterating. He's saying it requires the name and it requires the spirit. Where does the name come from? Being baptized, uh, Brother Oman said it. It also says it again in the book of Acts. It says in the original translation, it says, it says calling upon his name in the King James. In the original translation, it says of whose name you were called in baptism. There is a name that's called over you in baptism. That's found in Acts chapter 2. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and unto your children and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And after this, the Bible says only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus in Acts chapter 8. So what did they do? They called Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. They laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. What happened in Acts chapter 8? In Acts chapter 8, we have a very, very religious, devout Italian man by the name of Cornelius and he gave much alms and he prayed always and he said everybody who's associated with my household we will serve God what what a what a righteous man and in chapter 11 Peter was testifying to the council and he said God told me he gave me words whereby Cornelius could be saved. Well, Peter, what did you tell him? It says, while he yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them, which heard the word found in Acts chapter 10. What did Peter do then? The Bible says he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Most translations say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what happened in 2, 8, 10, and then 19? Read it in Acts chapter 19. Not in my notes, but you can put it up there if you want. In Acts chapter 19, verse 1, it says, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, found certain disciples. And he said, hey, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we have not heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said, how are you baptized? They said, by John the Baptist. We were baptized already. Man, we're, and, and Paul, he called them, he called them disciples. And he also called them believers. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And it says, finding certain disciples. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost? Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know what you're talking about. That's what they said. I don't remember. Don't you remember what John the, John the Baptist said? He said, I indeed baptize you unto Repentance. I baptize you into water, unto repentance, but there cometh one after me whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And the Bible says, yes, we remember. So what did Paul do? He baptized them again. Again? That's in the Bible? Acts chapter 19. He baptized them again. Look at it. In the name of the Lord 
Jesus. He rebaptized these people in the name of the Lord Jesus. Put to the next scripture. What happened? Then he laid their hand, his hands on them, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. What happened? You received the Holy Ghost since you believed? I, 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 I don't. Well, how were you baptized? Uh, some other way, some other church, some other method. Well, you got to be baptized in Jesus' name. Okay, I'll get baptized in Jesus' name because I want the Holy Ghost. Oh, yes. Let's do it the Bible way. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm sorry. I got to close. I, I got off on a tangent. But please, look it up. This is being recorded. Look it up on the website. Look up the scriptures I mentioned, and I promise you, they're there. They're, the Bible says, let, let every truth be established by two or three witnesses. I just gave you four. I'm sorry, I violated the scripture. I gave you four. Whew. Such were, I'm talking about keeping the change. Such were some of you. I'm so glad that I'm not a recovering alcoholic because I were one. I were a drug addict. I were a liar. I were lascivious. I were a fornicator. I were. But such were some of you. But you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. What you were, you no longer are because of his name and because of his spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry to get all bent out of shape here, but I know this. I know what I were, but I'm not that anymore. I haven't been that for 30 years. So if you are, you, you, you ours can become a were. You know what I'm saying. You don't have to be that anymore. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, that's a scary thought. We can call him Lord. And he said, some of you that do that aren't going to enter the kingdom. Why? He follows it up and says, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And then they go on and they're like, Man, you just caused doubt in my mind. I thought I was saved and now you cause doubt. Jesus followed that up by saying this. I just said this, but I'm going to say it again. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not, you fill in the blanks, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? You fill in the blanks. God, I taught Sunday school. I had an experience with you. Lord, have, have we not prayed every day? Have we not read our Bible through every year for 20 years? Have we not? You fill in the blanks. Jesus, have I not done these things for you? And it says, then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Never? Would you please stand with me? Matthew 18, 3, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. These are all either New Testament or statements Jesus made. Many times we ask for what we want. And as parents of children, we don't always give them what we want. We try to give them what they need. They ask for candy, we give them a hamburger. You know what I'm saying? We say, you know what? Four suckers isn't good for lunch. We're going to give you what you need. And the expectation that we have is, Jesus, this is what I want. I wonder today if we couldn't, when we come to the altar, if we couldn't, instead of asking for what we want, we could ask for what we need. Because what we want is for Jesus to change my day. And what we need is for him to change our life. 
I don't want Jesus today. I want him forever. But that decision comes day by day. But I want him to change my life. John 5, 7, the impotent man by the pool, he asked, Jesus said, would you like to be made whole? And his comment was, I have no man when the water's troubled to put me in the pool. What he's saying is, this is what I want. Here's what I want, Jesus. I want you either to help me get into the pool or find somebody that can help me get in the pool. And Jesus was saying, you know, you don't understand. That's what you want. You want to get into the pool, but I have a better solution for you. I have something that you need. I'm going to change your life. And watch this in in John 5, 7. Uh, it says afterwards, afterwards, he said, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And he did. And then he said this. The man got what he wanted. He got to walk. But Jesus turned around and he said this. Behold, thou art made whole. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. I'm going to go home and I'll see you again Wednesday. He said, sin no more. Lest a worse thing come unto thee. What was Jesus saying? He was saying, keep the change. I came into your life and I gave you an experience, a miracle. I gave you understanding. But don't do it again. The woman caught in adultery, getting ready to get stoned. Jesus walks up. Hey, guys, what's going on? Well, she was caught in adultery. What, you know what the law says. The law says stone her. What do you say? He said, well, let me just uh, put a little spotlight on the situation and write some things down in the dirt. And hey, hey, where are you going? Hey, weren't you guys going to stone her? It says from the eldest to the youngest. It's called the guys who knew what was going on. And when the young ones saw that all the others left, they thought, well, I better go too because this doesn't look like a good situation. Jesus said, where are those thine accusers? She said, Lord, I have none. And he said, go and sin no more. What was he saying? I gave you mercy. Keep the change. He was saying, I gave you a chance at life but it doesn't stop there. Stay that way. Do everything you can. How do you do that? Let me just say this. I, I walked into the church and I thought, man, that writing is small. There's a lot of words in here. The one that I had was like this thick. I said, there's no way I could live like you. You guys are all floating two inches above the ground and and I'm just a drug dealer, southern rock band player. There's no chance for me. And someone came up to me and they said, you know what you need? What you need is the power of the Holy Ghost and understanding of his word and blood to wash your past away. And I said, man, sounds good. What does that cost? Already been paid for. There was a comment made and I close with this thought. There was a preacher that was preaching all of his life and decided to quit preaching and he opened up a funeral home. Somebody came to him and they said, what in the world caused you to stop being a pastor and start being a funeral director? And he said, well, as a pastor, you know, you're just constantly working with people's troubles and, and you know, as soon as you think they're doing good, they he said, you just keep trying to straighten them out, and they just don't stay straightened out. He said, in a funeral business, once you straighten them out, they're... <laughs> I can't do this without God's power, God's mercy in my life. But I can tell you this. There are things that I was. I will never be again because I were. But Jesus looked at people and he said, he said, where do we get power? And he said, 
that power will come to you after, after, in Acts 1 and 8. Put that up on the board. Let, let him see it. Acts 1 and 8. He shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. He also said in Acts 2, you shall be witnesses. Of what? The way Jesus lived. If we will allow God to control our lives and then be baptized in his name, washing away our record, we can live this life for him. It's possible. So we need to change. We can change through his power. He said, if we come and live for him, he said, we are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You look, I studied that. That's in my notes. I just didn't have time. It's creative power. He said, become new. It, it's creative. We become a new creature in Christ. If we will give ourselves to him, we can beat this and we can keep the change. So we can be changed and we can keep the change. You're welcome to come to this altar. I invite you to come. But please come with the idea, Lord, I'm not going to ask you for what I want. I'm going to ask you to give me what I need. If you'll do that, I promise you there won't be a denomination that steps in. He'll step in. And he'll look it into the depths of your heart and he'll begin working on some things and he will blow your mind so to speak as to what he provides you won't have to look for somebody to help you to the water he'll go beyond that and heal you but then the comment will come now I need you to keep I want you to stay and grow I want you to receive what I have for you but not just until Wednesday I want you to come back Wednesday and learn some more and grow some more Jesus pray today that you would wrap what I said in compassion and love that you would bring understanding that you would feed hungry hearts I pray that people would draw from the wells of salvation God giving them some living water to drink today everything is available here healing baptism washing away our sins and the infilling of the Holy Ghost is available here. You can be restored. You can be renewed. Just come seeking His will. Come seeking what we need. Lord, what do we need today? Bless these wonderful people in hearing the Word of God. And I ask you, give us what we need. Give us what we need, Jesus. Let's worship. Let's pray. Let's pray. I invite our guests to pray. You can stay in your pew and pray. You can stand. You can kneel at your pew. You can come up to the altar. It doesn't matter. Jesus is here. Just pray. Jesus, what does this mean to me? Is he just a mean preacher? Or did he say some things from the Word of God that pricked my heart that I need to address? God, none of us are perfect. But I want to be like you. I want to be like you. Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, let's draw close to him. All things new, yes, you.
put that behind me today. And I'm asking you for forgiveness. Ultimately, remission of sin, God. I praise you, Lord. Give me the power to pray. God, to pray. Oh, your presence, Lord. To be changed by your presence. Things new, yes, you 